Let me start by welcoming everybody who's in the room and those of you who are joining us by uh, other means, webinar, telephone. Um, I'm Dr. Sandra Hernandez, and I'm the CEO at the California Healthcare Foundation, and it really gives me great pleasure to welcome you all here today. Um, you know, we've, uh, we have thought a lot as a foundation about how important uh, the Medi-Cal program is, and the conversation today is really going to be about how we get to delivery system reform, but I think it's really important to step back for a moment and recognize that this program is probably the single most important program in the state of California as it relates to achieving health and achieving uh, wellness in our population writ large. And really the power and the influence uh, and the achievements of this program uh, are not to be understated. And I think uh, the conversation that we're gonna have today uh, with the panelists, uh, with uh, with Cindy from Manat will give us an opportunity to really think about how a program of this size and of this import, both in the state and in the nation, can think about how we not just improve delivery system, but actually reach better health outcomes for the people of the state of California. Um, I'd wanted to also just acknowledge that in the course of this report, and Chris and Cindy will both mention this, many, many people were interviewed to get their perspectives on the Medi-Cal program. And I want to thank all of them. Some of them are on the panel this morning. Many of you are in the room or, or on the phone or on the, on the webinar today. Um, suffice it to say that everybody who is part of this program recognizes how important it is from a policy perspective, from a health care perspective, everybody has a vision for how it could be better and how it could be stronger. And really, that is the spirit in which we've engaged this conversation today. Uh, the Foundation really can't do this work without extraordinary leadership, and so I want to just take a moment to acknowledge Chris Perrone. He's our Program Director in Improving Access and really is an extraordinary thought leader in Medi-Cal and really has shepherded this entire body of work. So with that, please give him a big round of applause, and I'll turn over the program to him. Thank you, Sandra, and uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, I am Chris Brown, Director of Improving Access to the California Healthcare Foundation. And um, for those of you who are baseball fans, uh, you know that last night was the uh, was the All-Star Game. Uh, not so good for Giants fans, but uh, but nevertheless, um, I'm reminded of that today because we have here an All-Star cast. Um, starting with uh, Cindy Mann, who will be leading the presentation, but then including our reactor panel. So it's a terrific uh, group of people that we have here, and I'm sure what will be a very thought-provoking discussion. I want to add a little context for why uh, we uh, joined Manad in this project. Um, and Cindy will talk uh, quite a bit about the transformation that's occurred in the Medi-Cal program since its inception and over the past few years. Um, I just want to acknowledge uh, the fact that um, we certainly understand that uh, the Department of Healthcare Services and policy leaders and many of you who are working in the delivery system have been pushing a big rock uphill for a very long time, and in particularly in the last uh, four or five years. Um, with all that's gone on to uh, transform Medi-Cal to the the way it looks today, uh, the transition of seniors and people with disabilities, the additional benefits, the new expansion population, uh, coordinated care initiative, and even today, still so much going on. Three implementation of three waivers, uh, the 2020 waiver, the substance use disorder services waiver, the new home and community-based services waiver. We still have work to do on the coordinated care initiative and, and CCS transitions. Um, we have the, the integration of uh, undocumented kids into Medi-Cal. So there's a lot going on. And, uh, we are certainly humbled by the amount of work that our uh, colleagues and friends in the Department of Healthcare Services and, and many of you are doing. And, and I, I, while we talk about what more needs to be done, I want to make sure we, we acknowledge the fact that there's a lot already being done. And yet we know that for Medi-Cal enrollees, uh, they face twice the difficulty finding a physician as other insured Californians. Uh, we know that access to care is worse for those with the worst uh, health status, for people with disabilities, for those for whom English is not their first language. Uh, we know that quality is quite variable across uh, health plans. Um, we know that health outcomes are much worse if you have a serious mental illness. Uh, and we know that uh, most of those uh, who 
account for Medi-Cal's highest cost population uh, have some mental health comorbidity. So there is lots of room uh, to improve, and that's part of the context why uh, we're pursuing this. We, we're also observing what's happening around the country, and we're looking at states like Oregon and states like New York who are engaged in transforming their delivery system and saying, what about us? Why aren't we engaged in the same way? And certainly through the 2020 waiver, we're making a sort of a down payment on that with regard to the public hospitals, but we know the safety net is much larger than that, and we, we, we know more needs to be done. We're also, frankly, a little disappointed, as I think some of you are, but by some of the ideas that got left on the table in the waiver planning and negotiation process. Some of the ideas around workforce, some of the ideas around capitation payment reform, some of the incentives for further integration of behavior and physical health. And we didn't want to wait another five years before we resurfaced some of those ideas and the energy that was behind them. We wanted to engage uh, you all and many others in moving that ball forward. Uh, finally, um, the timing happened to be quite remarkable uh, with uh, Cindy Mann leaving CMS in her role as the, the head of the Center for uh, Medicaid and CHIP Services uh, and joining them in that team. And just as we were thinking about how do we relaunch this type of work, Cindy and her team at Manat uh, uh, reached out to us and said, uh, we're also aware of, of some of the opportunities that still exist for California. Is there a possibility to work together? And uh, really, uh, we have a long history in working with the team from Manat. They always do terrific work for us. And the opportunity to work from uh, Cindy, with Cindy and draw from both her uh, many years of expertise and knowledge on Medicaid and safety net populations, um, to bring that to California, to bring the federal perspective of what the feds think of California, what they know about us, what they don't know about us, uh, where they see the opportunities, the broad view of what's happening in other states. Um, but frankly, this is also an opportunity to, we know Cindy still has the ears of people in DC and is still uh, riding her scooter around the streets and, and uh, knocking knees with some of her friends. And this was also an opportunity to educate some people that work nationally about what is unique about California. What are some of our unique challenges here? probably less unique than we like to think, but still, there are some, some unique uh, challenges that we face here. Um, so those are some of the many reasons. I'm going to turn now to uh, the packets that you have before you and just kind of run through uh, what's in your packets and, uh, and run through the agenda. So you do have an agenda uh, in your packets. Um, and following my remarks, uh, Cindy is going to do a presentation of the, uh, the context and the landscape that they conducted of California's delivery system and then the priorities that are laid out in the report. Uh, we're then going to have a terrific uh, roundtable discussion. And so we don't sort of interrupt the flow. I'm going to uh, mention the speakers uh, now. We have Alfredo Aguirre from the San Diego County Behavioral Health Services Division, where he's the director. We have Dr. Brad Gilbert from the uh, Inland Empire uh, Health Plan, where he's the CEO. We have uh, Jennifer Kent, who um, told us she would be running a little bit late, um, but will be joining us for the roundtable discussion. We have Graham Knaus, who um, I'm just meeting for the first time today, but we had an opportunity to talk uh, previously and has a rich and deep expertise on uh, local state financing issues from the California State Association of Counties. Uh, Cindy, of course, and Dr. Bill Walker from Contra Costa County Health Services. So really a team of all-stars, and I wish we had twice as long for this discussion or three times as long for this discussion as we do. Um, but we will uh, move that along and, uh, and leave uh, some time for questions and answers as well. And then I'll wrap things up. Um, you also have in your packets a few other things. You have, of course, a copy of the report from, uh, that CHCF published from Manat. You have a list of the speaker biographies, so I won't um, delve further into their bios, but you have them there uh, for you. You have a copy of the presentation. And then importantly, you have an evaluation, which um, those of you who've been coming to our briefings know we always hand out, and you, of course, always complete them. But this one in particular has some new questions for you. Um, and we're asking for your um, opinions about the different priorities that are laid out. What, how would you rank them? What do you think is most important? So we want to hear back from you as to what you think of these priorities. It's not a, um, it's not a you don't have to rank them. It's a rating most important, least important, but please do take time to complete that. We are going to actually release the results uh, back out to this group and on our website for, for all to see. Um, and that will help you know, inform us and shape our thinking. And if you want to include your name, then we know to associate you with the things that you think are most important. You don't have to do that. It can remain anonymous. Um, but, but if you'd like to leave your name so we, uh, we can reach out to you, you can do that as well. 
So with that, I'm going to uh, hand things off to Cindy Mann. Thank you, Cindy. Welcome. Thank you, Chris and Sandra. Um, it is great to be here and to see so many of you here and know that there's many more um, on the phone listening in. Um, this has been a, um, I shouldn't say this, right, because they did uh, we did get funding for this, but it has been a labor of love um, um, and uh, and such an important um, area of work um, from my vantage point. There could be no more important program, I think, as, as uh, Sandra said, than the Medi-Cal program in terms of the health and well-being. Uh, one third of Californians are now covered um, uh, by Medi-Cal and beyond those individuals who get their coverage from Medi-Cal, the reach of the program in terms of the provider community, um, health plans, docs, um, care managers uh, is vast. And then, of course, the impact on the state and the local economy is very significant. So it has such an important role to play. And we are really very much at a critical moment in terms of the direction of the program that uh, it, was, it was an honor to be part of a project um, that looked at where we are, where, where are we right now, where do we need to be going? And what are the tools and the barriers um, that can help us move forward? And uh, so it, it's, it's been wonderful. And I want to particularly thank the California Healthcare Foundation for its vision in supporting this project um, and uh, very much extend my thanks to the many people who uh, we learned from in the course of this project. And you'll see in the back of the report all of the individuals that we spoke to. And people were enormously generous with their time and, frankly, very um, uh, very transparent and very much trying to be constructive about what the situation was. It was not a whining session at these calls. It really wasn't, and it could have been. Um, it really, I was struck continually by the energy that people brought to the conversation, the insight, um, and, um, and really a sense of trying to be constructive. Here's where we are. Here's where we need to go. Here are some of the problems getting in the way. So um, with that, let me uh, get going here. Um, the project uh, overview is um, really uh, pretty straightforward. What we did at, at Manat is look at the data that was available, um, and I'm going to come back to that a little bit because we have some missing uh, data in this in the state in terms of moving forward. But we did a pretty extensive landscape review, and not in your packets, but but online um, is a, a chart pack of some of the of the landscape that that we came up with in terms of uh, looking at the as is where Medi-Cal has been and where it is now. Uh, we interviewed a wonderful group of stakeholders, as I've mentioned, and we put that together both for the landscape chart and for the report. Um, what we really want to wanted to do is think about where Medi-Cal has been and where it is now. And in some respects, and we were talking about this a little bit before the meeting started, in some respects, um, Medi-Cal um, used to be this smaller program, safety net covered a subset of the population, and kind of was this program people wanted to like not think a lot about, because it was always a big part of the state budget, and then there's you know, the county role and the plans and all sorts of issues and can we solve some problem sometimes that Medi-Cal had, had created um, or can we solve another health care problem, whether it was HIV, AIDS or whatever the particular health care problem by actually expanding Medi-Cal. Let's do that. Let's have our work around and then let's hopefully um, let, let it go away for a little bit until another issue um, or crisis arose. Um, it now stands, of course, as the single largest source of health care coverage for, for those in California. And that's not unique. Um, it is the single largest health care program in the country. Um, so California it is our largest Medicaid program in the country. Um, but it, it Medi-Cal Medicaid generally and Medi-Cal specifically has grown to be really the foundation of coverage of the new coverage paradigm. And, um, and for those reasons and some of the other uh, implications that I outlined a minute ago, um, it is too big to 
ignore. It is too big to hope it just goes away. It is too big and too important not to really tackle the issues um, that um, can make it as strong as it can be. So I'm going to go very quickly through some of the, the landscape so we can spend a little bit more time on, on the where to go uh, part of the report. Um, but this is the documentation of that which you all know, which is that it's grown enormously over time, um, and certainly most most specifically in the, in the last couple of years since 2014 and the expansion. But what we see is that it, growth has been the nature of the Medi-Cal program because repeatedly California, like other states, have turned to Medi-Cal for solutions to problems. When we had infant mortality problems, we expanded coverage for pregnant women and for for uh, for children. When we had HIV problem uh, evidence and epidemic, we looked to the Medi-Cal program to think about how to serve those individuals. When we have a substance use disorder crisis, we look to the Medi-Cal program and think about how how to strengthen it and how to broaden it. So it's grown. It also grows in recessionary times, which creates budget problems, but that's the nature of the Medi-Cal program. It is a counter-cyclical program. More poor people, more people not without health care coverage in, the market, in their employer-based marketplace, more people come to the Medi-Cal program. Um, but what we've seen, of course, is a, a big change in the last couple of years as a result of the California embracing the Medicaid expansion in the Affordable Care Act. And now we have about 20% of our population in the Medi-Cal program are the so-called expansion adults. Um, but you see here, and you all know, what a diverse population it is. And they are bound largely by being low income. But beyond that, they're quite diverse. Some are very, very young, our youngest uh, citizens of, of, the, of the state, as well as our, our oldest. Um, some are disabled. Some are quite healthy, um, more likely to be Latino um, or African American, particularly. Latino um, than the general population. Uh, language issues um, therefore arise. And of course, the population uh, associated with its poverty tends to be in, um, in poor health in the population at large. While we focus a lot on the expansion and on the new lives brought into the program, it is always important to remember that it is our, our elderly and our people with disabilities that are the highest cost um, uh, enrollees because they have the greatest needs. So even with the influx of a large number of non-disabled uh, adults, what we still see, of course, is, and this is true, of course, ac across the country, is that people People with disabilities, people with chronic health care needs, the elderly um, reasonably consume the greatest amount of health care services. They account for 22 percent of the population in the Medi-Cal program, 61 percent of the cost. But as I think many of you know, it even gets more skewed than that. 5% are our highest cost beneficiaries account for 51 percent of our spending in the program. And that's particularly important to keep in mind as we look at some of the other big change that has gone on in the last few years. It's not just that we've brought in more people to the program, but we've really changed the way we have structured the Medi-Cal delivery system to serve them. Managed care has been with Me California Medicaid's program for many years, um, but as this uh, graph shows you, it has expanded enormously over just the past five years. And that also goes to Chris's uh, 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 hats off to the state and to all of you for uh, making that happen and making that happen as 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 well as you did. Um, it's not just, of course, that managed care grew and covered more lives. It's that it grew and covered more lives of people who are particularly have particularly high health care needs. It is not just the numbers of the people and now enrolled in managed care and the fact that it is statewide. It is the fact that you are now covering the highest needs populations, elderly, um, uh, people with disabilities, people with chronic illnesses. And that changes the demands and the pressures on our managed care system. So when we started out talking about the future of delivery system, we didn't 
really hone in on managed care as being the topic. But we quickly decided together with uh, we Manat and, and, and CHCF that that really made sense to be the focus of the inquiry. It's not to say there aren't other important issues going on in the delivery system, but it is such a big uh, part of the delivery system. It is the chosen path right now of California, and it's undergone such incredible uh, changes. So let's get to um, where we're going m moving forward. Um, we talked to a lot of uh, the stakeholders and tried to glean what the vision was. And we kind of thought initially that the project was going to be around developing that vision. What was the vision for delivery system reform for, for Medi-Cal going forward? But we actually quickly found out that there's quite a bit of consensus around that vision. And we didn't all have to spend a lot of time doing that. You know, you can wordsmith it and people can write it in different ways. Um, but even in the 2020 waiver, meaning well before the Manat report, um, there was a there was a, 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 a vision articulated that pretty much uh, reflected what we heard from the different stakeholders. So let's just go through a couple of these uh, the elements of this vision because uh, we're going to keep coming back to it. One is that, the, and, and you know, it's motherhood and apple pie. Nobody, I think, would disagree that these are key elements of a well-functioning delivery system. Coordinated systems of care. We've got managed care. We've got systems of care. The question is, do we have a coordinated system of care across the spectrum of providers, across the spectrum of the kinds of needs that our beneficiaries have? Um, another element is value and accountability. By any standards, and we'll talk, I'm sure, a lot about this as the afternoon goes on, uh, Medi-Cal is a lean program. Um, and uh, uh, but w whether we're spending too little or we're spending too much, what we can all agree is that the vision is that we need to get value for the dollars we spend. Certainly, it is a very large program. Ninety-two billion dollars was spent, and that's combination of, of federal and state dollars in the program. It is about 16 percent of state general revenues. It is not that that it is a footnote in terms of state budgets and state expenditures. Um, but the real question is, are we getting value for the dollars that we spend? And is there, um, is there a way in which we are assuring that we have accountability for the care that's provided? When, you, when we are spending that much dollars, but most significantly, when we are responsible for covering and providing health and health care to one third of Californians, are we assuring ourselves that, that we're, we've, we're getting what we want to get for those beneficiaries, that the services that are provided, that they aren't delayed in getting care that they need, that they aren't ending up in the emergency room when, in fact, their, their care is better, uh, is better provided in other kinds of settings? Um, we need stable and adequate financing, and that goes both to the level of the financing, but also we heard a lot from people. The Great Recession was not too far away from people's memories, right? We heard a lot of people talk about, like, maybe we're okay now, but boy, we had to go through some really rough periods. Are we making sure that we understand we are a counter-cyclical program and that we have the ability to weather through the next recession without devastating our delivery system reform? And uh, having been at CMS when you did a lot of the uh, the cuts in the in the last recession. Um, I um, can't say I felt your pain in the same way that I'm sure you all did, but I certainly was uh, very much aware of the kinds of wrenching decisions that went on during that period of time. So stable, adequate funding is a, is very important, and strong state level leadership. And that's an interesting thing for stakeholders to come up with. Um, a lot of times people say, just, I wish they'd all leave me alone. I wish they'd just let me do my business. And in some respects, what we heard a lot from stakeholders is that it's very diffuse. We need a little bit more um, cohesion in terms of knowing where we're going and the direction going forward. So um, the... Um, before I hit the recommendations, I do want to um, uh, note, and if you've read the report and mem several times probably, um, as you no doubt have, you, you know the ending, uh, which is that what we found is that while there's a good 
agreement in the community, which I think is pretty remarkable about the vision, um, and a lot of energy around trying to continually improve this program. Um, there was a sense that there are some barriers in place that make it very difficult to accomplish that vision. Um, that there are certain structural um, features of both the Medi-Cal delivery system and the financing system that make it difficult to get there. It is always difficult to get there. It's not easy business to provide good health care to people. Um, uh, and uh, But that search for value is hampered in some respects in California by some of these structural barriers. And we were told by stakeholders that, though, that moving forward, accomplishing that vision cannot be achieved simply by business as usual, nor can it be achieved by more initiatives. You know, let's just do another project here and another project here. There was some initiative fatigue, let's say, that we picked up among our stakeholders, um, uh, but that we really have to step back and look at what we can accomplish in the near term, and then what are the, not and then, because probably simultaneously think about those structural barriers and begin to have a robust dialogue about um, what's the pathway going forward. So the, that is really how we ended up organizing some of our recommendations for going forward. And I will say, and, and Chris can certainly uh, attest to this, we did a lot of different versions of this paper because it, this, where we ended up is not where we anticipated we, when we started this project. Lots of states are looking for how to, how to drive to better value. And there's, I wouldn't say formulas, but there's ways in which one can get there. And we kept thinking about trying to apply those formulas to California and those, way, those approaches to California, and we kept running into those roadblocks. We kept saying, well, wait a minute, if you do this or that, which you know some other states are pursuing or some other health systems are pursuing, it's going to be very difficult to pull off for this reason or that reason. And so we were stopped and, and, and really needed to go back and say, wait a minute, if, if we're finding that path hard enough um, in, under normal circumstances, but colored by the fact that we've got these structural barriers, what we need to do is call them out. So, but there are certainly, and as Chris noted, there are certainly um, lots already on, on your plates in terms of moving California forward, uh, moving Medi-Cal forward. And um, so we didn't want to just say, okay, forget everything that's on your plates. Let's just talk about these uh, structural barriers and think about solutions to the barriers. Because... Time, you know, it's all real time, and and we just had a waiver approved, and there's things in the waiver that are underway. There's other activities that are other underway, and there are also some things that could be taken up that um, will really help pave the path going forward. So that's how we thought about the priorities for the near term. These are all ideas and issues. Probably not surprising to any of you, but uh, th because it arose from all the conversations that we had. So you can look through them, and I'm not, for purposes of time and, and keeping you from being terribly bored, going to read through these, uh, these priorities for near-term changes. But I want to pick out a few that I think um, are worth um, special mention. First is the one that's number one here, which is intensify efforts to coordinate care for people with serious mental illnesses. We have a very challenging environment in California. Again, it's not unique to California, but there's nuances in California that make it even harder, right? You have a situation where people are enrolled in managed care, and if they have a mild or moderate mental illness, their managed care plans and the, the entities that contract with their managed care plans are responsible for that care as well as their physical health care. If they have a severe mental illness, they are um, to be treated in, in the county mental health system. That is traditional in a lot of states where the mental health system grew up for lack of funding in the counties, lack of funding in the Medicaid program for it in many respects, and it grew up in the counties, and the counties were there to really provide that frontline service. So that's not unique, and we have states around the country that are really struggling now for how to 
care for the whole person, how to integrate physical and behavioral health. And it's been identified certainly in California, which is it's no surprise to anybody that it's on this list. But I will say as we've talked to the stakeholders here um, through this project, uh, what became clear is that it needs more attention. It needs more focus. It needs more energy um, and, and maybe some su more support on how to fix fix the problem. Over, Remember that 5% of the beneficiaries that account for 51% of the cost? Over half of them have a mental health condition, right? So um, it is a major cost driver in the program. And I think none of us would sit here and say that it works to have somebody over there that has no relationship with somebody over here to deal with the different parts of the person's health care needs. Um, they, are, they are too integrated in that person um, to be disintegrated and fragmented in our delivery system. So there, are, there is now a requirement that plans and counties have a, ma uh, a memorandum of understanding about how they're going to move forward and uh, coordinate and integrate care. And uh, we think that's great and a, and a step forward. And I've looked at a couple of those MOUs. But um, I think that we need some more energy and focus on that. And it's, again, easy for me to say. Really hard set of issues. Um, and um, it goes to some of the structural issues as well in terms of a fragmented financing system and a fragmented delivery system. But while we deal with those structural issues, I think we need to think about what we can do to augment the efforts underway to uh, coordinate care for people with serious mental illnesses. I want to also focus on number three. Um, we have a situation, and this again is not unique to California, but we have a situation as we set rates for managed care plans where when managed care plans uh, invest in initiatives that are um, improving health, improving health care, and lowering costs, that we have what I call, um, this is a non-technical word, a term, uh, premium slide. Right? Great. You are able to uh, reduce preventable hospitalizations. We do want to reduce costs to the program. That's a good thing. But if every time uh, a health plan reduces preventable hospitalization, that goes out of the base for the plan uh, payment, then they don't have the ability to do that next investment that needs to happen. So a way to think about how to restructure rate setting, not necessarily the big value-based purchasing change that um, maybe down the road, but how to stabilize and think about rates so that we are rewarding innovation, we are in rewarding investment in the kinds of things that I think we would all agree are important to invest in um, without creating a disincentive um, for those investments because the savings achieved um, essentially go away and uh, there's no ability to reinvest those dollars to continue to strengthen our system of care going forward. I'll mention number four, uh, which is an easy one to talk about, aligning incentives across Medi-Cal and across the marketplace. I, um, there's, uh, I, th I think I'm on, on sound ground when I say this, but you all jump in uh, in the discussion if not is if I look at what goes on across the Medi-Cal managed care programs and all the providers that are contracted underneath it, I can't say that here's the top three things that everybody's working on together. Plans and providers have their agendas for sure. It is not to say that people are asleep at the wheel. And it is also not to say that what works in San Francisco is what's going to work in Orange County. Um, but it does mean something when everybody is rowing in the same direction. And because so many of our providers are contracting with different plans, um, when they are pushed in one direction by this plan and pushed in another direction by another plan, it doesn't necessarily give us the greatest bang for the buck. It doesn't necessarily help us move forward. So there's lots of ways to think about aligning incentives and aligning priorities across the Medi-Cal delivery system with 
without hamstringing the innovation, the creativity, and the local control that you want to have so that it makes sense. And there's also a lot going on in California in the, in the rest of the marketplace. Covered California, CalPERS um, are, are doing a lot of interesting things. Medi-Cal is a lot bigger, um, and so I would never be the one to say Medi-Cal should just follow what those other players are doing. But we should be in, in as much dialogue and harmony as possible. And I know there's discussions going on, but it's really I, I think it's important enough to, to call out and say, um, again, the more we're all moving in the same direction in a very complex environment, uh, the, the better off we are in terms of being able to achieve uh, that vision. And then finally, the last one on this list that I'm going to call out is, uh, just because I'm a geek, is uh, focus on data improvement. Um, I kept saying to the team that worked together on this report at Manat, wait a minute, where's the data on this? Wait, 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 where's the date on that? And I, we couldn't find it. And it wasn't for a weak team. Um, it was a really strong team. Uh, there is, uh, we are in a data poor environment, at least what's publicly available. I know there's lots of information that plans and providers submit to the state and the state Medicaid agency sees a lot of that. But for us to, us, the collective us, to be able to answer some key questions, are we underfunded? Are we overfunded? Who's, where are we seeing utilization problems? Where are we seeing difficulties? The public data are not there um, to be able to really uh, inform us. And in a value-based coordinated care environment where you want to have accountability, data is your bread and butter. And so um, it's, it's not lacking just because it's nice to look at spreadsheets, but it's lacking because it's our baseline for thinking about what problems are most salient, what problems are most important to go after, and to also judge how well we're doing as time goes on. So I want to call that out because it's really important for the here and that, the now, and it's really important for going forward. So let me get to the, um, the barriers um, that I mentioned before. Um, and again, I don't think they're surprising to anyone. Um, this journey to value-based, uh, accountable, coordinated systems of care are hard, uh, is hard under any circumstances, but I think we do have some structural roadblocks to reform. And these are some of the key ones that we've identified. There's a few others that are mentioned in the report. Um, and again, I will go back to some of the findings where people in Medi-Cal were twice as likely to report um, difficulty finding a, pro uh, a provider, four times more likely to visit the ER um, due to a chronic care conditions. We have barriers in terms of access. We don't have the outcomes that we'd like to have. If we had a complex system, um, a fragmented delivery system, and a fragmented uh, financing system, but all is well with the world, OK, it works. Um, but I think we have signs of stress and signs of problems viewed from our beneficiaries' point of view. And these seem to me key areas that we need to focus on. Fragmented delivery system. Different examples of that, the mental health situation that I talked about is, is clearly one uh, of those situations, as well as um, some of the delegations and subcontracting that goes on that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Fragmented financing. We haven't talked about that yet, but we have a system where 25 to 30 percent of the financing for hospitals uh, uh, serving Medi-Cal beneficiaries is, is going through not the regular way of, of paying for, for care, but is going through separate supplemental payments, not tied to patient care, not tied to quality, not tied to whatever the uh, other initiatives that the uh, managed care plan or that the state deems important in terms of going forward. Um, and again, in mental health, we have fragmented financing, as we talked about before. And all of that means that we have limited transparency and accountability. And let me, let me go to the next slide to maybe uh, uh, talk about that. This slide, um, this picture is in, in the report. And um, we have situation in California, which is unique to California. I've said a lot of things are like not unique to California. This is unique to California, though it's not unique to Medi-Cal, right? Delegation exists in California, and it exists in your Medicare Advantage programs. It exists in the commercial market. Um, so it's not unique. But what we have in California is a, is a structure of the Medi-Cal uh, managed care delivery system that was really devised 
a couple of decades ago when it was a much smaller much, uh, population, a much more homogeneous population, and we've kept with that sy uh, system. Uh, but the, the program and the responsibilities have kind of outgrown that. And the, the best example probably is in Los Angeles County, where which has about 28% of the managed uh, care enrollees, where you have two plans that contract with the state but then you have six plans actually serving beneficiaries because those two plans cannot handle the business going on in, Calif in, in Los Angeles County by, their, by themselves. So you have um, subcontracted plans, and then you have the plans delegating um, some of the risk and responsibilities to different provider organizations. And the, the subcontracting is not as common in other parts of the state, but the delegation is common in lots of parts of the state. And so as you can see from this diagram, which is pretty simple, um, uh, uh, and, and in fact, the, the arrangements tend to be much more complex, is you can have um, uh, one delegated entity that brings in a different entity that's not even under contract with the particular plan because it needs to worry about how it's going to conduct its business and whether it's going to have the resources available to serve beneficiaries. It is, um, I. It is hard to imagine a, uh, the, the accountability being more attenuated. And it is also very hard from the beneficiary point of view to figure out who is in my network, who am I supposed to be able to go to, who am I not supposed to be able to go. So it's difficult to manage at almost every level of, of, of the system. And when you look at the HEDA scores, for example, they're rolled up by in Los Angeles County by the two plans that contract with the, uh, with the state. And so you don't really know where the strengths and where the weaknesses are in your program in terms of quality measures and other things that will be very important. That's the kind of thing we're talking about in terms of a fragmented delivery system in addition to the kinds of uh, the example that we gave a minute ago with respect to mental health care. Let me give you this slide um, to talk a little bit about the, the spending issues. Um, over, over the period of the, really since the last, uh, since the Great Recession, um, Medi-Cal, well, Medi-Cal costs have risen dramatically because we've been covering more people, not because we've been spending a lot more per, per enrollee. Um, that's actually been uh, pretty modest growth, about 3.1% averaging over this period of time per enrollee. But obviously the program has grown enormously. But what's interesting from this, that's not a surprise to anyone who knows the enrollment changes. What's interesting here is what we've seen is um, less reliance on the general fund and more reliance on other funds coming in. And that's most provider taxes and intergovernmental transfers. Uh, payments from the counties um, coming in, payments from providers paying provider taxes. That's fine. That's perfectly legal. A state, states are always interested in how to diversify how they're going to come up with their non-federal share. And certainly in recession, uh, a lot of states look to other ways in which to bring in that non-federal share. The difficulty is, is that the way these dollars then get um, moved through the delivery system and, um, is that they tend to still be in a, that same fragmented mode, right? They're not the, the you don't take the provider payments and the county contributions and put it in the pot and you just pay your Medi-Cal bills and hold everybody accountable under the same terms. Needless to say, when different players are putting in their dollars, they have an interest in how those dollars are spent. And so we have a fragmented financing system where, um, um, as I mentioned before, particularly around hospital care, uh, where 25 to 30 percent of the dollars coming through the managed care plans are coming through, not really from the managed care plans themselves, but through this uh, payment system that sits on top of it. So what we, uh, what we are asking ourselves, I think, is, is that current structure of managed care best suited to drive and support that vision? Is that financing structure one that will provide that adequate, stable financing that allows everybody to be accountable for the vision and, um, and the items that, that, that fall within that vision? Um, some of the questions that we've laid out here. Um, sorry. 
um, around the care delivery system? Should all plans have a contractual relationship, a direct contractual relationship with the state? How can delegation be used to advance accountable systems of care? Delegation is not inherently bad. Um, it may, a uh, lot of states, I mean, Chris, Chris mentioned looking at New York. New York is looking for um, managed care organizations, managed care plans in New York to contract with health systems to take on risk. Um, and that's really what you do a little bit in your delegation. But you're not delegating a, a, to a system. You're delegating to a particular kind of provider um, and pushing risk down, but to uh, physicians or to hospitals over here as opposed to a system of care that treats and cares for the whole person. What is the county's role? You know, Medi-Cal started out, and this is uh, 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 true in a couple of different places around the uh, around the country. It really started out in some respects because the counties held the the responsibility for providing indigent care, and Medi-Cal came around and said, "Well, we should use Medi-Cal to help the counties meet that obligation." What is the county's role in a program which serves now one third of the of the uh, residents of California. Um, is is that same role um, the appropriate role? And what about social determinants of health, which everybody recognizes so critically important as we move forward, where the counties have a special insight, it seems to me, in terms of uh, how to bring the community together and community resources together to do that. So it's not to say that counties shouldn't be part of the story. What is the right role for counties at this point and at this time? I'm just going to move quickly um, to talk about a couple of the financing questions so that we can move to the panel. Um, financing system, I think we've touched around this on this. Is the level of financing sufficient? But also, uh, is, it, uh, is it directed and raised in a way that allows that integrated, coordinated system of care and the accountability that we've talked about? It's easy enough to say, well, that makes no sense. Let's change the way those supplemental payments are paid to, to hospitals. Um, but is that non-federal sh non share contribution still going to be made when, um, uh, when the payments are not in the form of supplemental payments, but really when it's spread throughout the throughout the program. So these are difficult questions. These It's easy to point to some of the issues, but resolving some of these questions are, um, are challenging, is challenging. So let me, uh, let me why, uh, pull together here and, and uh, uh, finish up by one, uh, by noting again, I think what I noted at the beginning, that I'm forever struck with the innovation, the energy, um, the constructiveness of the stakeholder community here in, in California uh, moving forward. And certainly the, the state Medicaid agency has taken on uh, an enormous set of challenges um, and has performed amazingly well. So we really did want to call out some of the innovations that are going on in the state. And, uh, you know, we could have done a whole report on those innovations. So we don't mean to... to um, to ignore many that are going on. We really provided some examples because we wanted to call out that, yes, there's a lot of issues that, that arise. There's not the kinds of results that we want to see in terms of health care for our beneficiaries. There's problems to address. Um, but there's great things going on right now. And there have been great things going on for the last uh, period of time. And we want to make sure that we have the ability going forward to support and to grow those innovations. Um, and uh, and while the at the same time look at those structural underpinnings and make sure that they are strong enough to be able to get to the vision of care that I think we're all looking at. Um, Medicaid is too large and too important to miss this opportunity. So I want to again thank uh, the the um, California Healthcare Foundation and all of the partners and people in this room and beyond who helped us um, uh, pull together this analysis. Thank you. Whew. Well, that's uh, that's quite a pace, and we're going to uh, we're going to keep it going. Um, a few things, you know, there I'm. Uh, 
the report covers a lot of territory, um, as you know, and, and as Cindy did in her remarks as well. Uh, we've we've got uh, an, we've got a little over an hour left for our discussion. Uh, a scant time to talk about all the issues that were surfaced in the report. Uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, we're going to use our time uh, with the reactor panel to talk about a couple of those issues, and then when we get to the Q and A, uh, open it up to you all to uh, to ask your questions. You can touch on er other areas of the report. I want to invite our panelists up to uh, up to the front. And uh, thank again the, the panelists here because uh, many of them uh, got up very early in the morning and uh, flew or drove quite large distances to get here, and we're not giving them nearly enough time to uh, engage with them in discussion. So I want to I want to thank them and, and welcome Jennifer. You were, did, yeah. I know you. Yeah. I, I didn't get enough. a chance to. Yeah. So, um, so let me start with you, if I may, and and uh, I feel somewhat apologetic that we're not giving you uh, an opportunity just to do half hour of remarks on your own, but um, uh, probably uh, uh, a little easier on you this way. Um, but let me ask you, just in terms of sort of reflecting on the report, and we know you've. You've uh, read it a few times and provided some criticism. In fact, uh, uh, Jennifer and, and her colleagues at the department and a number of others, including uh, Brad Gilbert and, and Richard Chambers here in the audience and looking for others, uh, did provide um, some feedback on earlier drafts of the report. We got a lot of uh, good uh, insights and additions, uh, as well as some critical feedback, which was really helpful, I think, in strengthening the report and, and uh, caused us, anyways, to acknowledge the fact that there is a lot of great work happening, both within the department and out in the delivery system. So uh, we'll repeat that once more. So in, in terms of the, the vision and the pathways that are laid out in the report, is there anything that in particular resonated with you as something that grabbed your attention? I know this is probably familiar territory to you, but something that really uh, lights your fire or um, grabbed your, your interest? Um, I'm just tired. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, I, I read this report and um, it just makes me tired thinking about it. Um, you know, I think the report called out what we knew, right? So you, in working with us, um, really just kind of highlighted some of the things that we struggle with every single day. So when you talk about structural barriers to the program, you know, we meet with people all the time, plans and counties and other provider types, and they come in and meet with us and say, just do it this way. You know, just pay us this way. Just change this one little thing for us. And we hit the same structural barriers that you identified. You know, there's legal reasons why we do things the way we do. There's federal rules, there's court cases, there's you know financing obligations that go back 20 plus years. And so um, the report in some cases, you know, just both um, highlighted and confirmed that there are reasons why we do the things that we do. And it's because we either have to or it's because there is something there that we cannot change ourselves as a department. I think the um, area around the better integration of behavioral health and mental health is something that has obviously been um, something that we've known about for a long time in that you have two very different systems and these individuals um, straddle them and it's not to their benefit. And so um, in some cases when we look at the CCI as one of our kind of initiatives um, I like to call that the Super Bowl of healthcare delivery in terms of moms and babies are very easy to put into managed care and they're very easy to take care of and they're relatively cheap and you pay for labor and delivery and you pay for some vaccinations and maybe an antibiotic hither and yon and that's all that you've got to do and then you've kind of stepped up the um, both the work and the expectations and the complexity of the CCI population. So if a plan can be successful on CCI, you have pretty much mastered the universe in terms of healthcare delivery. And so I think that you know we, working with the with the plans, have increased our both expectations and oversight. But as your report notes, you know we've started the process, but we're not finished. And it just you know it will take time. And five years from now, Medi-Cal is going to look very different. Um, Ten years from now, Medi-Cal is going to look even more different. And I, you know, I will just stop with this: the um, federal rule on Medicaid managed care is really going to revolutionize certain parts of our department. Um, so, for the managed care quality monitoring division and our Medi-Cal operations division, not as big of a deal, right? We're going to have to make some modifications. We're going to have to change a few things, but it's not revolutionary. And then you um, talk to our mental health. Um, colleagues and our and our counterparts that are also implementing the SUD waiver, and that is a 
huge lift for them because that is not the way that they do business and the expectations from that rule have to be both um, implemented in our department but transferred back out into the counties and those expectations have to come to fruition in terms of network adequacy standards, network filings, all the appeals and grievances and stuff. And so just that rule alone will change what Medi-Cal is doing five years from now. So in some cases it's in process, it's just a matter of um, managing expectations and I like to under promise and, uh, and over deliver. So that's kind of where we, that's where I come to the conversation from. There are certainly um, a, a number of game changers, the Affordable Care Act being uh, being one of them, and, and uh, the federal government working in, working with states on duels uh, was something that they were loath loath to do for many years, and I think states were pushing pushing for um, mental health parity and. Um, and I wonder if, uh, and I'll ask this direct this uh, question to uh, Bill, whether or not um, you, you think that uh, those changes um, give us an opportunity to revisit some of these structural changes in a way that maybe we couldn't uh, five years ago, either because we were fighting other battles or because the imperative wasn't as stronger. Do you think there's a greater appetite for uh, diving into some of these structural issues uh, now? It uh, depends which structural issues you're talking about. Uh, it's certainly, the, the opportunities to, to implement the, uh, the 2020 waiver, uh, particularly with the, the, the prime and the whole person care part of it, which begins to get at the social determinants of health, as someone said, um, simultaneous with the SUD waiver and simultaneous with the development of health homes. Uh, gives us a lot more material to work with, and I think it drives some integration within our, our own department. In, in my own department, I do have all the, all the pieces. I, we own the health plan, the hospital, the, the uh, behavioral health division, uh, as well as public health and, and the other divisions. So uh, even breaking down those silos within one department is not easy given the constraints of the funding mechanisms. I, I think that the, the structure that doesn't get undone uh, is the structure that we've talked about, the obstacles about uh, IGTs and the obstacles about county share and the non-federal match and, uh, and the relatively slim uh, state contribution in terms of, of the total cost of care. So I, I just have trouble getting in my mind. Uh, we can all implement our waivers locally and we, and we are probably doing it in ways that vary from county to county. Uh, the problem is trying to figure out how to unravel the basic funding mechanism when the counties are actually putting up a federal match expecting to get it back and now with a new kind of 10-year phase in of the managed care rule uh, having to figure out new ways of whether in fact we can continue the IGT mechanism uh, in, in its current form uh, number one and number two if counties are going to be comfortable putting up money without being guaranteed they're going to get it back that's a, probably a major issue in my county and another so so yes and no. It, 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 the, the new programs provide a lot, a lot of opportunity, but it doesn't, they don't necessarily undo the structural barriers. So. Cindy, you um, uh, have uh, some insights into the new federal rule, having studied it uh, quite closely and interpreting it for some of your clients. And um, maybe you can share your thoughts on just how much of a, a game changer you think that is in terms of some of these financing issues. Thank you for not mentioning that. I probably worked on it at its earlier <laughs> stages for people not to throw things at me. Um, I think it is potentially a game changer, but it doesn't, you know, it, 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 it will prompt uh, uh, revisions, but it doesn't set what the cl clear pathway is. Um, so what the managed care rules do in particular is say longstanding CMS policy is you can't under managed care. You're supposed to have a capitated payment. The capitated payment is supposed to pay for what goes on inside the contract between the managed care organization and the, and the providers. And uh, these notions of pass-through payments um, are not part of what CMS in ever envisioned to be a managed care construct, so gave states a formula and a 10-year period to phase down and um, I think that uh, it it opens the door for that discussion I mean sometimes uh, very difficult questions um, it takes external forces to say okay something's going to change so the question back I think to the panel and to others is 
is is is the opening there to have some other discussions about what needs to be done because status quo is is not going to be an option and uh you know it was i think actually california uh public hospitals that once said to me in a in a conversation i was having about supplemental payments that it is uh, a blessing because you you know, federal dollars were going down because general state revenues weren't available, particularly during the recession, and it brought in some federal dollars and a curse uh, because they're they're shouldering that responsibility. So there's a lot of rethinking, and it's pretty hard to, to work through. But I also saw California, when it went into 2014, you had a lot of responsibilities at the county level, a lot of responsibilities at the state level. You did some, I thought, um, amazing realignment in, in a, when I thought about that going on, I thought, how are they ever going to figure that one out? Um, and you survived. Um, and, and you know, I'm sure everybody thought it wasn't perfect. And I'm sure whatever solution we come up with around um, the non-federal financing won't be perfect. But um, there's a resiliency um, and now an external force that's pushing us forward. Uh, these and there's two uh, microphones on the floor if anybody wants to grab them. But um, these um, the uh, issues uh, that the report uh, confronts are all intertwined, and so maybe we could uh, roll up our sleeves and dive deeper into a particular issue that I know um, uh, cuts across the work that each of you do, and that's the the. Uh, the priority of intensifying efforts to uh, integrate care for people with serious mental illness. And um, the report calls for both uh, stronger efforts to coordinate care, but then addresses some of these structural issues in terms of how care is delivered, how care is financed, and the bifurcation between uh, the physical health managed care side and the counties and behavioral health. And um, I'm wondering if there's a solution to this problem that is in the interest of the, the consumers that doesn't involve uh, uh, a different uh, financing, a different structure to the financing and delivery. And Brad, maybe you could uh, pick up this conversation and talk about what you, you're doing a lot as the report highlights in the area of behavioral health. We've probably taken those issues about as, as far as most, um, particularly where you're not a health plan and a, where the, where the, you're not a health plan that's part of the county. So um, what are your thoughts about that issue? Sure. I want to make it clear that I'm outvoted three to one by the counties. I just <laughs> want that to be clear. So. <laughs> So two anecdotes. I'm going to start with anecdotes. You know, doctors love anecdotes. Even so, we're supposed to be scientists. We still love anecdotes. So the first one, 53-year-old IEHP member, schizophrenic, previous history of both heroin and meth use, clean, schizophrenia well controlled, takes two buses every day to go to what is essentially a day treatment center run by a substance use and abuse treatment center. So he's really going for socialization more than anything else. But I want to point out, well-controlled schizophrenia, clean with his meth and heroin use. So a success, right? Hemoglobin A1C, 10.5. So Riverside did a study of their seriously mentally ill, and those individuals died 20 years earlier than anyone from a different cohort. That gentleman, if we don't get his diabetes under control, will die early, right? So the story there is that we have no connection to that entity on the Medi-Cal side because it's part of this other system of care. So they may have known, they could have known about his diabetes out of control, but there was no way for them, which was his regular place of care, to get that information to us because there's all these problems, most of which are made up, frankly, about sharing data because we have two systems of care that are different. And so for me, what really needed to happen with that individual because that was his place of care is we need a family practice nurse practitioner or a primary care physician at that site to identify and take care of that diabetes, try to work with that member to see if he needs higher levels of care to help him get to that higher levels of care with our help, of course. So, but that to me is a great example of the system not working well at all. Really well on one side, terrible on the other. And this is one human being, this is not two human beings. Second anecdote, I'm going to take you back to 1987, personal anecdote. I was a young man, doctor, had a rat tail, long hair, <laughs> if you can picture it. I worked in a primary care clinic that basically took care of seriously mentally ill for their primary care. It was a county clinic, so it was the Harold D. Chope Hospital before it became San Mateo County General, so it kind of dates me. So I would have these patients come in, hypertensive, diabetic. They'd stop taking their medicine because the TV told them that the medicine was bad for them. So the point being that they were getting out of control on the other side, their schizophrenia, their bipolar. So I would walk down the hall, talk to the psychiatrist, and say, and this is going to date me again, we need to adjust his Haldol dose. 
because he's not taking his Haldol, which then results in him getting out of control, which results in him not taking his medication. That was information sharing and integration of care in 1987. Are we any better? Are we any better? We still don't share information between the systems. When that individual goes to the behavioral health clinic in the county and is known to be getting out of control, guess what? That's going to have a huge impact on his health care. Do I know that? Maybe because we have great relationships with our counties and Dr. Curry has liaison specifically to each county and it's part of our behavioral health team, but that might be kind of luck if we know that. So for me, it's way too simple. I'm going to be, you know, I don't care about financing. I don't care about the politics. If we really want to take care of this individual, it has to be through a single system of care with a single medical record that allows for that almost instant communication when something's happening on either side. And of course, there is no either side. It's happening to the person. So for me, you give me the money. And guess what? I turn right around and contract with the counties because they know how to take care of these individuals. But now I have a single medical record. I can, I can transfer data in both directions. We have a system of care that takes care of that member in a holistic way. So to me, that, that works. You know, I hate carve-outs. They don't make any sense to me because people aren't carve-ins or carve-outs. And so I give Jennifer incredible credit because this is the same issue as CCS, no different kid in two systems of care. She's pushed and it's been really difficult to push towards a whole, you know, a whole child care, caring for that child because the child is not a serious chronic illness and preventive care. It is a child with all of those needs. So for me, it's simple. I'm simple sometimes. I know that the financing is incredibly complex and the state constitution has a problem, which was like a, a shocker to me. But I mean, there's still problems about basic data sharing ab around these individuals. We just did a report for the uh, feds and state about our uh, CalMedi Connect population. Um, they wanted to show us the denominator for those with serious mental illness. They didn't do the, they didn't pick the right diagnoses. So we got all of our people with really with behavioral health d disorders, 40%, 40%, 8,242 people using the ER at incredibly high rates. Um, the Medicare, we have full responsibility. I contract with the county for the individuals that they care for, for serious mental illness, but I have full responsibility. That member is our member. And so I have inpatient, outpatient, substance use and treatment, everything. And that works. And it works even with our partnership with the county. So to me, it's doable. But there are some barriers. Uh, Alfredo, I wonder if you could uh, talk about this from your perspective in, in working in San Diego on some of these same issues. Do you, is, the, is the solution to uh, give the, the plans all the money and, and, uh, uh, and contract back with the counties where, where you're organized a little differently there in San Diego County, but uh, uh, is, that, uh, is, that, is that the path to better care for people with, uh, with SMI? Is it a single system of care? Well, certainly, I would confidently support that if every health plan had a Dr. Gilbert with uh, uh, that kind of background, uh, understanding of the public mental health system, the history of the public mental health system, uh, understanding uh, the role of safety net, uh, his understanding of how systems need to work together. And unfortunately, we don't have that. So um, I, I think it really varies uh, county to county, region to region, depending on how well that county's uh, behavioral health um, carve out, especially mental health plan has been, has been run um, in terms of uh, strong MOUs. I know, Cindy, you looked at some MOUs. Um, the CCI was mentioned. Certainly, there's been a number of primary care behavioral health interface programs. Dr. Gilbert mentioned one going back all the way back to San Mateo. I remember those days. I used to be there as well. And count, you know, there's been some great counties, Shasta County, San Francisco. They've developed great models of in, you know, integrated primary care behavioral health services. Um, but it's, it varies dramatically. And if you want good outcomes, health outcomes, you want to cut down the disparity, there is certainly a good reason to integrate under one plan, have it integrated, have it carved back in. However, um, what you what the risk is is you may sacrifice those important outcomes you've achieved as a public mental health system, developing a robust system of care, a rehabilitative model, recovery based model. Most counties now are integrating with alcohol and drug. So in integrating and putting it under a plan, again, not every plan has a Dr. Gilbert, uh, what kind of sacrifice are you going to have? You know, the role of consumers, the role of strategies to engage people who are refusing care. 
there is some excellent work going on there. And again, what would be, what would be forfeited? So you may lose out on some of those important uh, mental health goals that you've achieved, uh, those outcomes, uh, while perhaps achieving better health outcomes. So I, I do think uh, something to be considered is perhaps um, as we transition, if that is going to become ultimately where we go, uh, we have to be ready as, as, as behavioral health directors to work, continue working with the health plans. We're lucky to have a good relationship with health plans in San Diego. We're going from five to seven managed care plans uh, under Healthy San Diego. Um, we, we've managed the mild to moderate to people with serious mental illness, the transition, the toggling back and forth, we've managed that quite well. Um, but I think all of us as, again, behavioral health and mental health directors have to begin to work with health plans to be ready uh, for that uh, you know, inevitability of an integrated system. And again, as Dr. Gilbert said, there can be a transition. Certainly we have a vast provider network in terms of county mental health. When that happens, uh, at whatever, whenever that occurs, uh, the idea of contracting back to the mental health system makes a lot of sense. And finally, I want to say is around financing. Um, we're going to have to talk about uh, how the, the ec uh, economy-based funding system for public mental health, where does that go? We have certain investments of realignment dollars, which is sales tax, uh, the Mental Health Service Act. Uh, we've invested in expanding a robust um, uh, plan of services for our beneficiaries, for mental health services. Um, where does that money go, those investments? Uh, what about the whole, you mentioned uh, population health. How do we ma maintain that er, you know, early interventions, uh, those er early intervention strategies, prevention strategies? How do the, you know, what role will they play in the long run? So again, um, the work's cut out for the public mental health system. And I think while we get to that point, that big decision on ultimately how are we structured, I think we have to continue to work on you know, either targeted integration efforts or continuing the uh, cross-systems care coordination um, that uh, Dr. Gilbert highlighted that's happening in Inland Empire. So. Thank you. Um, so, Bill, you um, you have the advantage of, as you said, working in a health system where, uh, uh, while you still have some integration issues to, to that are that to work through, uh, you're all part of the same system. What? Um, where do you sort of fall out on this? Where? How far can we go without uh, the kind of integration that Brad is describing? Can you uh, can you get to a patient-centered approach, um, uh, in, even in a county like yours, or do you have to go? Do we have to go further and address some of these? funding and realignment issues? Well, first of all, I want, I want to agree with Alfredo. I think the last thing we want to do is begin to unravel uh, what really is a strong community-based uh, mental health system. So it, it's, it's functional, it's, it's working, uh, it need not be undone. I think the issue is how the money flows. And um, in, in our own county, I think we've, we're coming a lot, cl even though we've, uh, we've had a, you know, a integrated department for a long time, the true integration between behavioral health and the ambulatory care and hospital system has really not gotten off the ground until we had the change uh, in the health plan being responsible for mild to moderate care. So the health plan has actually provided dollars in the ambulatory care system for the behaviorists to begin to provide that care. Uh, and now we're moving into a better integration with uh, the, the chronic seriously persistently mentally ill. Uh, and that gets back to information sharing, which Brad mentioned. Um, we implemented the, uh, the EPIC electronic health record in our hospital outpatient clinics detention uh, health care as well as our health plan in, in 2012. We tried to integrate mental health uh, into that at that point, but EPIC was unable to handle it. The new version of EPIC uh, now allows us to begin that integration, and we've, we've begun it with the, on the psychiatrist side, so we can get the shared uh, psychiatric consultations, uh, medications, et cetera. The hard part is getting into the community-based mental health records uh, and, and CBOs and everything that goes beyond that. But I think we're beginning to get there. And I think, again, it's been driven by a, initially financial incentive to, to, to do it. Um, and, and more to the point, now that we have the other uh, waivers to implement, uh, particularly the, the SUD waiver, uh, it, it drives that further integration more. So I don't think that um, necessarily you'd have to take on the issue of how the money flows from the state. God knows I don't want to take on the state constitution, whatever that means. But, uh, but um, having the money flow to the county, in our case, works. Uh, however, if we had six health plans to deal with, 
our, our, our health plan actually has 85% of the Medi-Cal enrollees in Contra Costa County, so it's relatively easy to do, but I, I can't get my mind around doing it through six health plans in San Diego, so. And Brad, you've, I'm going to come back to the finance issues in just a second, but Brad, um, I know you've uh, made a lot of progress in terms of the, the data sharing in, in, in Empire. What are you finding in terms of some of your successes there and, uh, and continued challenges? Where, where are you sort of hitting roadblocks? So on the non-county side, for the individuals that we're responsible for, we require a form, web-based form, that's very comprehensive. Signs, symptoms, diagnosis, treatment plan, everything for the behavior, uh, behavioral health uh, practitioner to be paid. And then that information, when, si when assigned consent from the member, which actually shouldn't even be required, but we do it just to be careful, can be trans we, we send that electronically to the PCP with an alert that they have a new behavioral health record for one of their patients. And then the data can, tr can transfer back as well. But on the county side, it's been tough, and it's been legitimately tough. Separate system, of course, no, no connections between our systems electronically. And they see it as additional data entry if they have to do yet another form, because they have to do the work they have to do to do their documentation for Medi-Cal. So we're working to try and pull the data out of their system, populate the form, and get it. But it's been really difficult. And on top of that, you have one county council is one county council, and they make the determination whether there's a HIPAA issue or there's issues in apparently the Short Doyle and the uh, Lanterman Petrus Short Act that get in the way as well. And okay, let's get around that. We've got to be able to share clinical information, and HIPAA should not be an issue at all because it's clinical information transferring between clinicians. So we've had barriers, and so even with our good connections with the counties, there's been electronic system and legitimate workload issues. So the county suggestion was we put a data, you know, a data entry person in each of their clinics, which we didn't, you know, would be a little bit expensive for us. But again, if I had the money and was, you know, paying, I'd make sure that was part of the process. So to me, it would be much simpler. And, and I agree. I mean, I don't think there's any reason to not use what has become a very good system of care for this population. So, you know, whether it's kind of what, what Jennifer, you're doing with CCS, where there's mandates around who's used as providers and what the standards are for those providers. I mean, I think there's ways to, to protect and make it happen, but you know, Alfredo and Bill are absolutely right. The last thing we want to do is defund and destroy what is a very good system for caring for these populations. But my quibble would be really good on the behavioral health side, not so good on the medical side. I uh, we. Um a lot of interesting things are happening in San Mateo. We often get criticized for studying San Mateo because uh, everyone thinks they're they're so unique. But I'm realizing that the, the the path forward is not trying to replicate what they're doing in San Mateo. But having learned that Alfredo and Brad both have a history in San Mateo, perhaps it's just exporting the people that work in San Mateo to other parts of the state. Um, Graham, uh, so Alfredo touched upon some of the, the financing issues and the, and, the, and the notion that we have an economy-based system for funding mental health services. And I'm wondering from your sort of perch, um, we, um, we did, the, the governor pushed some successful realignment in the last, uh, the last few years, and uh, that had sort of heretofore been sort of a third rail. But what do you, what do you see as the opportunities for addressing some of these uh, thornier uh, uh, financing issues between the states and counties? What do you see as both a, sort of the optimism? Is there op do you have some optimism? And what would you say are the um, the key uh, the key challenges to, to moving forward? Well, uh, first, I'd want to step back and just reflect on the amount of change that has occurred in the Medi-Cal system over the last several years. And it is astounding the amount of change that has occurred, the uh, growth in the enrollment, the change in the way that the program is structured uh, and uh, the involvement of the plans and the evolving county role, uh, as well as the state. That's all remarkable, and we should reflect on that um, as a starting point. Uh, I also think we should never stop pushing each other. I mean, this is an area, there's a lot of ideas about how we should be moving forward, what the vision, you know, we can agree on the 30,000 foot vision. Um, the question is what happens in terms of what that detail means, what's the timeline, um, who's at risk, how to make it functional, and all that needs to be part of the discussion. Um, we've had realignments. They're very, very difficult to pull off. Um, there's lots of vested interest in it. From a county perspective, we always approach a potential state-county realignment cautiously. 
Um, it's in order to be successful, you have to have the risks um, line up with sufficient resources with the right amount of authority with the right amount of flexibility at the at the local level so that what the state is attempting to do can actually get put into place and we have the tools and the recognition that the system plays out a little bit differently on a county by county basis so that's that's the key formula in order for it to work and it varies dramatically depending upon what we're talking about and when we've been through so much change over the last few years, um, we become even more cautious about wanting to make, um, wanting to consider another uh, potential realignment. And the reason is that the ground is not stable. So we're all still trying to figure out how to put in place what's already been approved. And so working out on the mental health side, uh, the MOUs and ensuring that we're building the relationship with the plans the way that um, we need to build them so that it functions for them, so that it functions for us. We need to work that out, and that takes time. It takes longer than I would like it to, I think longer than any of us would like it to, but it's a reality. And so that's, uh, you know, that we have to let it play out a little bit more. And when we have a place where we have greater stability in terms of resolving some of these open questions and working through um, challenges that exist either on a statewide basis or in individual counties, um, to me, that's the time where we sit down and we start thinking about, where well, is there another way that we should design the system? There's no one in the state that would have designed the system that we have today. It happened, hmm. right? And it happened strategically, uh, almost as like accidental strategery, right? So we, there were um, very um, thoughtful changes that have been made and then built upon each other after many, many years, and the situation in which that they were, you know, their context was completely different, and so we're solving for a different problem each time we engage in one of these large-scale changes. And so when you look at it as a whole, it doesn't make any sense at all. But it's our reality, and we. Um, so I wouldn't want to undo what we've already put in place. Uh, I'd want to, you know, when we think about counties and the mental health plans, um, that's largely working. We would assert that there are challenges that go back a long ways relative to sufficient resources, and that's relevant. Uh, and we'd want to put that in. Uh, you know, put that as part of a, any uh, discussion. Uh, the mild to moderate population is, is one that we were uh, in a pre-ACA world that we were um, serving, but not because that was part of our formal responsibility or was included in our mental health contracts with the state. It just, there was nowhere for anyone to go. And so these are all live questions that we would need to think about. Um, and um, I'd want to do so when we have a really stable footing in terms of the overall program. And we have uh, we give some time to all of us working out with each other. Um, uh, the evolution of Medi-Cal, because it's, some of these issues are going to go away over the course of the next 18 months or so as we're, uh, as we're working through the details of such a massive change. And others will absolutely not. They'll be front and center, and we'll need to tackle them. Uh, let's just do so while the car is not moving down the street. Um, I, I, will, uh, I won't hold my d breath for the day where there's uh, stable ground underneath us, but <laughs> one of the things that uh, sort of in the prelude to this conversation, one of the things that you and I discussed was how oftentimes these kinds of changes, whether they're realignment or uh, progress on duels, come, from a, uh, come during a period of deficit. They come during a period of if we don't do something, it's all going to fall apart. Um, and yet, for the very reasons that you describe, which is um, counties want to go into this, as does the state. Um, understanding that they have the resources to pull off whatever is being asked of them, understanding that they there's time to plan. There's, 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 uh, you know, there's never time to plan during a crisis. So maybe you could just reflect on, you know, sort of recognizing that the ground isn't stable now. Um, when do you see that time to, uh, uh, you know, if we wait till the ground gets stable, we may be in the next economic crisis, right? So um, that may be the reason that we move forward with something, but it probably wouldn't be in the way that we would plan it if we were planning it today, where we have a relatively 
relatively rich resource environment. So what are your thoughts about that? That Any additional thoughts about sort of timing? and? Where's that crystal bottle? Is somebody holding it back there? Um, I, well, I think uh, it's at least a several year time frame, I think, in terms of actually getting some, uh, having some greater stability overall in, in terms of the changes that have, been put, that have been put in place. But I think um, the, we cannot underestimate the importance of um, pushing each other. As I had said previously, we must continue to push each other in terms of um, where, how we can improve the system. And to me, that's about, it's about um, coordinated care. Um, I'm really excited about the whole person care pilots. I think there's a lot of promise there in terms of how we can think differently about service delivery, how we can break down some of those data barriers that Brad was talking about. Those are real, and they are uh, a lot bigger in some areas than they are in others, and they need to be resolved in order for the system as a whole to move forward. And um, there's, that's going to take a little bit of time to actually um, put in place um, once we we all try to hit the ground running um, come early next year, so uh, I think there's a lot. That's a that's a significant piece of it, uh, certainly um, uh, for me. And um, you're right; these things often happen in a recession, uh, which is what makes us very cautious um, as counties because we're it's typically solving a problem that doesn't have anything to do with us, and so it's a way. It's a there, these are typically, realignments are typically about shifting fiscal risk, sometimes programmatic risk, but typically it's fiscal risk. And if the fiscal risk is coming to us or if it's coming to anyone else, we want to make sure that it's done in a way that makes sense programmatically so that the folks that we're all charged to serve actually are getting the services that they should, but that also it doesn't leave us holding the bag, which could then further erode the the system um, and lead to uh, lead to declines in terms of the way that services are provided. So we need to we have to be very cautious about that. But I would also say realignments don't happen overnight. Um, the you can, we can go all the way back to the early '80s and um, the beginnings of what turned into the 1991 um, realignment, and the same is true in terms of what happened in the. 2011 realignment where there were lots of discussions that had occurred on a number of programs and shifting responsibilities between the state and counties th um, that occurred years prior and that created a, uh, a platform by which folks could further engage in the conversation. And sometimes we walk in the door kicking and screaming, um, but we still will sit down um, certainly with our state partners uh, and with other stakeholders and try to figure out is it the best way to make it work work. We just have to do it in a context that has the political reality that we do so largely putting ourselves at risk in terms of our own local sustainability. And uh, that's an important part of the ingredient. So, Chris, can I give a reality check? I mean we're not going to be in a stable situation. I don't see that. I, mean, I have a running joke with my board. I do an annual evaluation with them, and I want to start with the sentence that says, last year was a really calm and mellow year. <laughs> I've been able to do that in 20 years, eight and a half as CEO. And so, I, I mean, I, I absolutely appreciate We have the same issue. We, be, we get given risk without necessarily knowing that we're being given the funds to deal with it. And I don't see any stability for any period of time, given the mega reg, Given a lot of discussion at the federal level about, you know, is it a cap-based system? Is it a grant-based payment system? So I think we have to keep changing and looking for what is the right thing to do. And I appreciate, because I, as you may know, I was director of public health for two counties. I understand counties and funding and financing, although it was back in the day, back in the day when you were just a health officer, um, you know, <laughs> is... I get that, but that can't stop us from trying to think about doing things differently. Because I'm going to go back. Great job in behavioral health. Hemoglobin A1C at 10.5, the guy's going to die 20 years early. Hey, his behavioral health is well controlled, but he's dead. I mean, not to be dramatic, but I mean, that's the reality. And so I think, I think we're not going to see stability politically or financially 
for the near future. So, I, I mean, I totally understand and sympathize. And then I got to make one comment before you get into the financing thing, a thing that Cindy said that's unbelievable on the plan side. 3.1% change for the individual cost of members in Medi-Cal. Compare that to the change that's occurred around commercial premiums during that time frame. So one of two things exist. Either the plans are doing a great job. Maybe we're underfunded. That would be the other thing I'd be concerned about. <laughs> Although not right now. I'm, I won't say anything right now. So I think, but I think, I think that context is really important, and it's back to the central issue. If you're going to deliver a service, you have to have the dollars to do that. If you're going to be required to deliver it at the county level or the plan's going to be required to deliver it, there has to be the funding there. That, I don't think we're going to all, you know, we're all going to agree with that. Thanks. I'm going to uh, open it up for uh, Q questions and answers from uh, from those here in attendance. Before I do, did you want to chime in on this real line? No, you're. Uh, I know you have some <laughs> probably have some scars there as well. So um, uh, we have about uh, 25 minutes left, and uh, I know we've got a lot of smart people with ideas and questions and comments uh, here in the room. And uh, raise your hand, and we'll get a microphone to you. I think we're getting microphones to you. Yeah, my colleagues are. Uh, so uh, here's, here's one in front. Just wait one second. One coming. Hi, my name is Ethan Evans. I'm a PhD candidate at UC Davis, and I had a question for Ms. Mann. You highlighted the uh, unique or surprising assertion from stakeholders that the state should have a strong level of leadership moving forward. Could you talk a little bit more about what they said that role should be or how they understood leadership? Fair question, and I'll let other people jump in and talk about that. I think it's a little bit the um, issue of people being uh, solving all the problems themselves. I mean, I was struck with different uh, interpretations of the legal uh, ability to share records in, you know, from different lawyers, you know, the, the, the old expression, you get five lawyers in the room, you'll get 15 opinions, right? Mm -hmm. And I wrote a note to myself, it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, there could be an answer. And is there a way to pull together an, an, an answer that people can abide by? But of course, understanding everybody's gonna think they're liable and I'm not gonna abide by that decision. But I think um, feeling like there's a, uh, there's a lot of respect for local control and local decision making, um, but there's uh, sometimes an opportunity to pull things together so that things can move uh, more consistently and aggressively. But I'll let other people who maybe have voiced that to speak up as well. You know, and I, I, I do think that the, the funding issue is part of the issue. I mean, a s state is at a disadvantage when it doesn't control all the, the dollars, um, the decisions, um, and, you know, maybe is, is even worried about the level of funding, you know, a, a state is going to be reasonably cautious about throwing its weight around. So the, those issues are very intertwined, I think. So at least in the, on the behavioral health side, um, some of the statewide stakeholders, I think, um, clamor around the notion that the state should take more control over county MHSA plans, whatnot. And I think it's because I think there is a distrust that there is going to be consistency across all the counties in achieving the um, you know, stated goals of the Mental Health Service Act. Um, now it's local control. It's, it's approved by our Board of Supervisors. And it's driven. The plans are driven locally. So I do think there's a bit of a, um, I don't know if you, if you talk to statewide stakeholders, but certainly on the behavioral health side, I think uh, they would like to see more state control, and, and as a behavioral health director, uh, I'm good with the way it is now. Um, so, um, and my stakeholders would say, keep it local. So, anyway. I mean, I think it's I think it's hard um, when you talk about you know this scary thing called the Constitution in the state, um, and you talk about financing. You know, I've heard the comment a lot, which is, well, if we could just simplify it, and we'll just give you the state the money, and you can spend it. And Brad's you know raising his eyebrows, but. You know, when 
when you have a state like ours with a ballot initiative process that you do, you talk about just the general, the state general fund in and of itself, and 40% of it is constitutionally directed to education. And voters very, very clearly voted for that, and they want it that way. And it will, unless something really, really crazy happens, it will forevermore be that way. And so when you have certain kind of calls on the money, it's really difficult to just kind of say, well, I'm going to wave a magic wand and give that money to the state because counties who are um, the most, you know, in some cases, critical partners that we have for, you know, think about public hospitals and eligibility workers that actually get people in the door and, you know, behavioral health systems and all these things, um, they don't want to put up money unless it's coming back to them. And then there's this other little constitutional issue that requires a two-thirds vote of the legislature in order to actually raise funds or to change major funding streams. And so, again, <coughs> if there was a a, you know, a, a leader in the state that could just wave a wand, not even the governor can do that. You know, it requires this very, very significant, um, large scale mobilization of, of both political will and programmatic direction in order to change those fundamental financing things. And so I just always have to call that out because, you know, the MCO tax and the hospital tax occurred at the worst part of the state recession. And that was because both the hospitals and the plans um, you know, recognized how important Medi-Cal was. And so the reliance now on that funding source, you know, by and large is, you know, propping up a very, very large program. And if it's, you know, transferred over to the general funds risk, that goes away in an economic thing because of how we rely on corporate gains and all of the income tax, which is very unstable. So, I mean, you just have to kind of think through some of the economic realities of how the money even comes to the state and then how it gets divvied up by the Constitution or how you raise it according to the Constitution, which is also a stumbling block for a lot of those things. Yeah, really touching on some of the things that, frankly, in some all states face, but some of the really unique elements of California's financing. So I, w I will say that with respect to the question about state leadership, I don't think there was a sense that the state can just stand up with a magic wand and solve these kinds of financing questions, that it really does take a concerted dialogue. Um, so I you know, want to be clear that was not the area where, um, you know, oh, if only Jennifer would stand up and make these different pots of money line up <laughs> in a different way, it would all work out. Though she'd love to. Though she'd uh, love to. Chris? Chris? Uh, yeah, just, no, just sure. uh, briefly on that issue. I think I'm not sure the the issue is really state control versus state no, we'll creative leadership. And I think that was perhaps best uh, demonstrated by the cooperation that that the public hospitals had with the state in the implementation of the waiver. Of course, we wanted 17 billion, but we'll, we'll do with six billion for a while. But I, I think I think what that showed is is the partnership between the state and the counties to really effectively work together to get what people thought was going to be a, a big uphill climb. So, yeah. Hi, Andy Patterson with the California Primary Care Association, the State Association for Clinics and Health Centers. So fascinating conversation, really enjoying it intellectually and curious where CHCF will continue to take it. Um, but I wonder where the patient voice is here, because I'm thinking, it, would an industry, would a business, a private business have this conversation with just the shareholders? Would we not ask the patients what they would like the system to look like? Because we could intellectually create the most fascinating policy scheme, and they wouldn't come. And I just wonder, even the, we're asking ourselves the same questions of our patients at the clinics and the health centers, what would they want, and how would we integrate that voice into this conversation as we make very challenging decisions? Let me ask uh, maybe Bill and, and, well, Alfredo, Bill, and Brad, who are work sort of closest in the delivery system in that sense, how you, how you engage uh, consumers in some of those decisions about when you think about uh, pulling together, whether it's, uh, whether it's on the duels, a CCI demonstration, or whether it's integrating physical behavioral health, how you integrate the, uh, integrate the consumer perspective and, and, and needs into that, in those, in that planning. I feel like I'm in the home run derby, I'm getting a hanging curveball. I'm going to hit over the fence. That's an easy one, at least in county behavioral health world. Um, we're required uh, to have consumer involvement to do stakeholder forums every year to evaluate our spending priorities as it relates to the Mental Health Service Act. And so it's ingrained in our system of care since the, frankly, since the probably early 80s in terms of 
the consumer voice, uh, peer-driven care, peer specialist being part of our system. So it's an excellent point. Um, you know, one of the things I think as a behavioral health director that I've become to re I've come to realize after the ACA is I don't think all behavioral health directors see this, and that is that they really are the administrator of a, of a health plan for specialty mental health services. And, and maybe that changes the dialogue between us and our consumers of service and approaching that dialogue, being sensitive to not just access to mental health care or SUD services, but also access to good health care. Frankly, and we have good organizations that uh, hold our feet to the fire around access to health care. Um, but I think it's something that we have to take on. We have to take that role more seriously as, as directors. And um, so, and, you know, so it's a very good point. Uh, they, their voice should be here. Yeah, I would second that with regard to the uh, behavioral health system, but I, I think that in, in our system it's best evidenced by our emphasis on patient and family-centered care within our delivery system, and particularly within the, the improvement projects with DISTRIP and now with PRIME. Uh, patients are at the table in all of those efforts and, and getting their input. I think what we've learned is the most important thing for really, for really making it work. So I think the, the waiver incentives themselves have really driven patient and family-centered care for us. So. Thanks. So we have two formal member committees, one that's kind of a general member committee and then one specifically for persons with disability who have a variety of disabilities. <coughs> excuse, excuse me, so that's one form. But we get 1.5 million calls a year from our members. <coughs> excuse me, so what they don't wanna hear is we don't deliver that service, you need to call this other entity. Even when and there's a situation where we facilitate it, I mean, where we have you know, direct access to the access points within the county. They don't, they want it to be simple, they want it to be easy, they want it to be coordinated. I mean, and that's even true in the medical field when they go to a specialist and the specialist says, well, I don't know anything about you. What, 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 why are you here? Which is our bad, obviously, in terms of not transferring. So, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that members want an easy, simple, don't have to go through multiple steps to get the care they need. So the more we're integrated, the better. So example, if you have a primary care physician, in a, I'm sorry, in a behavioral health clinic, so that they get to go right there, and that individual with the diabetes can have his care right there at a place he trusts and knows, golden for the member, versus well, you know, you got the health plan. Remember, you're a member of IEHP. We're providing your care here, but you need to call them, and then they'll help you get to your PCP, who then will do a referral to an endocrinologist. I mean, that doesn't work for people. So, I, I mean, I totally agree with you, but I don't think it's that complicated. I mean, I really don't. I think it's actually pretty straightforward. And the more care you can deliver in place, so FQs that are doing telehealth or doing, you know, um, mental health at, on their site or doing additional specialty services at their site, bringing in orthopedic surgeons or neurologists or psychiatrists or whatever, that's what people want. I mean, they kind of want Kaiser, most people, um, and, but we can't get there, but we can get a lot closer than we are now. Thanks. Great question. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Peter Hansel with CalPACE, the State Association of PACE Programs, the all-inclusive care for the elderly. Uh, we're players in the Super Bowl of integrated care, but I think we're on the special team probably. We come in occasionally. You need to uh, stick with the baseball metaphor. All can right. You, there, uh, can we you, hit the grand slam. Kidding, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I guess my comment is I think our members' experiences with people with really serious chronic conditions, so the higher they go on the scale where they have overlapping conditions and are heightened risk of nursing home placement, the, m the more they need a very closely managed model of care, and there really aren't too many of them. Um, I'm talking about a model of care that manages care in real time, multiple touches, uh, highly sophisticated inter, uh, interdisciplinary team. But things are changing at the federal level. So there is new authority in the innovation office at CMS to explore at adapting the PACE model in ways that people have never even thought of it, uh, inviting organizations to come forward and propose ways to adapt model and, and operate as integrated care providers across the whole spectrum of services, acute mental health, long-term care, and social um, and, and do it in uh, ways that really for which there's not much structure. It's really kind of an open open process. So And there's funding, so it gets around the silos, it gets around the fragmentation and so forth. Anyway, this has a long way to go. It's not going to solve the problem for hundreds of thousands of people, but it is sort of an R&D concept, and I guess I'd be interested in 
anybody's thoughts on the panel of have you looked at this? Does this look like it could be part of the future direction for solving some of these problems? And Peter, I'm sorry, what was the name of the, uh, is it a particular, does the project, does it have a name? Pace oh, the Pace Innovation, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Anybody? Is it, is, it, is it being funded in certain sites now, Peter? It's, uh, it's not up and running. CMS is working on the protocol and the RFP. Probably, probably come out, and ho we hope, in 2017. But probably the first population will be the younger folks with disabilities. Um, seems to be the target they're starting. So, with. so we have a variation of that in San Diego because I... I'm a mentor to a, my mentee was, uh, works there as a social worker and I learned a lot about the PACE model there and it really has a lot of promise, um, particularly for our older adults with uh, multiple conditions, so it's a great point. Yeah, I uh, represent uh, the Skills Nursing Facilities in California as a provider group. First, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Brad Gilbert. Uh, we had problems when the CCI started, and uh, we called uh, Dr. Gilbert, and he was the first one to sit down and meet with us and resolve those issues in three weeks, unheard of in this business. So I want to publicly thank you for your attention. My question, though, is for Cindy and for Jennifer, and it, who, have, by the way, have had two of the most difficult jobs in the world. Uh, the issue of uh, the coordinated care initiative, when you brought up your chart and you showed uh, what, what you call the delegation continuum and uh, what we saw in skilled nursing facilities in, in prior to uh, the CCI, uh, we had two payers, Medicare, Medicaid. Now all of a sudden in LA, we have 19 payers, 19 authorizers, 19 account receivables, 19 cash flows. What's happened in our industry is it now has consolidated. It, uh, all the individual local folks have all gone out of business. They've all sold their business to a bigger provider because I can't manage 19 uh, IPAs and six health plans. Jennifer pays once a week, every week. Cash is there, <laughs> electronically, deposited in, <laughs> electronically deposited in your account, and managed care looks at, well, we're not sure whether 43 or 44th day we should pay, but we want to make it before the 45th. That has created a huge consolidation. We've had over, over 100 buildings in LA change ownership during this period of time out of about 400. Are you seeing that same issue nationally, or is it the IPA phenomena not happening in other states? Because for us, I've seen this huge push from family-owned business to big company business. Uh, are you seeing that in any of your other areas where consolidation has become the new buzzword? I think it's, I think it's not unique, um, but I think it also brings up the point that um, there, there is no stability, that, that there's consequences to the situation just flowing along in, in, its, in its way. There's consequences to the guy who's going to die early. There's consequences in terms of the, the marketplace. There's consequences in terms of costs. I mean, we haven't, you know, we happily have been focusing on the patient care issue, but we're wasting a whole lot of money that I think is sorely needed in our Medi-Cal system to be reinvested. So I think, I think your point is that the, um, uh, there are unintended and intended consequences going on every day. And one is, as, as you point out, and it is really important to, uh, to take into account that as difficult as some of these issues are, um, that we want to be a little bit more in control of our destiny in terms of thinking about what's the right uh, place to go and what's the, not the right place to go. I think there's been a lot of worry in terms of long-term care area as to whether or not there would be consolidation and some of the little guys would just get pushed out. Um, uh, and that's true in the nursing home industry. It's certainly true in the home and community-based care. It, um, it's part of the long-term services and support world as well. Um, and, and those concerns, I think, have been borne out in, in different parts of the country. I mean, I, th I think it's the, yeah, I, I would agree the nursing home industry is not unique in that we've seen hospitals 
buying up other smaller hospitals. We've seen um, physicians, you know, I call them onesie twosies. You know, they're the standalone doctor in his office with a thermal fax machine and his wife serving as both his receptionist and his biller is either not in business or they're not going to be in business much more. Um, you know, I think in certain counties who may or may not be sitting next to me, um, there have been uh, recent purchases of pediatricians such that there's basically one pediatric medical group in the entire county. And so those seven plans or five plans, soon to be seven, are saying, I have to negotiate with one pediatric medical group. And if that pediatric medical group doesn't want to do business with me, I'm looking at Shelley in the audience, then they get into trouble with Shelley because they can't meet a network adequacy standard. And so th th it's both good and bad, right? Um, you don't have to contract with 900 onesie twosies because that also will make you crazy from a plan standpoint. But the market leverage has really changed. And depending on the area that you're sitting in in California, in Los Angeles and Southern California, the hospital market is very different than the hospital market up here in Northern California. And so, you know, just one merger or one acquisition can have huge consequences. And that can be both a good and a bad thing. And so um, I think that's what, you know, Graham and others are starting to, you know, say and we're all acknowledging is is that there's always going to be change and it's whether it's a big change or a tectonic plate change and so that's kind of what i'm kind of in the um, seat for in terms of i know it's just going to be bumpy and it's just a matter of do i get tossed you know off the off the track because it's such a bump or is it just something that we're just going to have to to write out and and come up with workarounds and other types of things to ameliorate the the problem you know it, it's a it's a catch-22 because we made strategic decisions to say no we are not going to delegate skilled nursing except on the skilled side with Medicare which to me is a little different around around coordinating care we made a decision to do behavioral health in-house and do all direct contracting and with a direct relationship with the county so those are strategic decisions but that means you've then got care at different levels that you have to coordinate and integrate because the concept of delegation done right not just a shifting of risk is that you get the care closer to the care delivery system System. So you have doctors directly responsible for organizing, this is the perfect world, organizing themselves in a coherent way to deliver comprehensive care to the member in an, in an organized, efficient way. So if you make strategic decisions to not delegate, that impacts then the ability to coordinate the care. We happen to do that. We think it worked out okay. But it has consequences. So it, it, it's especially in California's market where there are some highly organized very effective, high-quality medical groups. Very good. Not a lot of them in the Medi-Cal space, but that's a different issue. Um, you know, a lot of them don't do Medi-Cal, which is unfortunate. Some do. So that delegation question, I'm going to make Dr. Sales explain LA Care and their delegation system. <laughs> My new chief medical officer came from LA Care back in the, you know, a while ago, because that to me is overly complicated. And actually, John Bacchus would say the same thing. He wants to really change that structure to make it a little simpler. But there's a, there, there's a price either way. Well, I'm going to uh, give uh, Brad the last word there and uh, apologize to those of you who uh, still are waiting to ask questions, but we're up against the time. And uh, I really do want to give folks an opportunity to uh, complete their evaluations and, and particularly uh, please do uh, rate these priorities. Um, Andy uh, Patterson uh, asked the question about, uh, you know, where is CHCF going with this? And, and uh, I, I did want to share that we really do see this, uh, this work as a springboard to lots of other the work that we want to we want to do and we are doing uh, with many of you. Um, as I said at the outset, we what we didn't want to do is wait another five years for the next waiver negotiations. If there will be a next waiver negotiation on the on the big 1115 side uh, to to renew some of these conversations. So um, we have work uh, that is either underway or that we're launching on across many of these recommendations. I think some of you are aware of that work, but um, we have, for example, we I don't know where the person from PPIC is, but I think there's somebody here from PPIC uh, who's uh, working with us on uh, thinking about uh, options for uh, financing uh, Medi-Cal with a real understanding of the Medi-Cal program will continue to grow, whether it's on the enrollment or cost side, um, and we're going to have continuing needs that we need to feed. Um, so what, is, uh, what are some options there in terms of financing the program in a longer term? Uh, on the payment reform side, we had a, a few of us had a good conversation this, this morning to try to kick off some work there to, to at least address the 
the the uh, the disincentives to investing in the delivery system for managed care plans. What Cindy referred to is if you save money this year, it gets cut out of your rate two years later. So can we at least address that? So we uh, some uh, work beginning there. Um, in the area of behavioral health integration, we have a lot of work underway, as I know many of you do. Um, one of the issues that was discussed today was the data sharing uh, issue, and uh, we're launching some work uh, actually with, with the state, with the agency, around uh, to, to try to address some of the, the uh, guidance around what the data sharing opportunities and, and windows are there so that while we can't change the fact that county councils have some discretion, at least they have um, some guidance that they can uh, adhere to and, and a little maybe diff, di, di, more difficult uh, road if they want to um, deviate from those. Uh, we're working with the state on the implementation of the substance disorder service waiver and many other things there. Um, colleagues here that are working on a uh, statewide work group on overuse. It's, I think, a good reflection of the opportunities for public and private payers. This is CalPERS and DHCS uh, and Cover California working uh, together to address uh, uh, opportunities for reducing uh, opioid overuse, to addressing treatment of lower back pain, to addressing C-section rates, so there's opportunities there, and really um, working across the recommendations. So um, stay tuned, uh, much more work uh, coming out uh, along there, some you know reports and work groups and opportunities to engage with us there. Um, and I thank uh, those of you who are either working with us now or um, soon will be. I want to thank, of course, the panelists and um, for uh, taking time out of their busy days uh, with all the change that is constant in our lives now and all the priorities we already have for them to take uh, the time that they did today for what is really a brief conversation. I wish we had, again, two or two or three hours to talk with them. So, um, And finally, to thank those, again, who contributed to the report, um, the Manat team, the people that were interviewed, the people who reviewed a first draft, um, uh, and, uh, and those of you who are here today uh, participating in this conversation. So with that, we are adjourned. Thank you.